Hi, Paul. Hey, buddy. Hey, how are you doing? I'm doing really good. Hey, I've got another one for you, Villa. Keeping oh, no, up not, with our not, not another yeah, joke. Yeah. Absolutely, oh, yeah. Keeping up with our tradition of the bad ones. So here's one for you. Okay. Why do Bitcoiners not like Ferraris? Hmm, I guess Bitcoin is usually like Lambos, right? Uh, to the moon and all that stuff. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I, I, I'm sure you have a better better answer to this one. Oh, because Ferraris are related to Fiat. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> I think last episode I was asking, why do we do this in the first place? But uh, yeah, I guess we just have to keep on going. I don't know how to go under that anymore, but we'll try next time. Uh, anyway, thank you for that, Paul. <laughs> You're welcome, my friend. Perfect. All right, dear listeners, welcome back to Fintech Daydreaming. And in case you're listening to us for the first time, first of all, we're sorry about that joke, uh, but we're also delighted that you decided to give us a chance uh, for the first time. We are still the podcast that dives into the world of banking technologies and the ever-changing landscape of fintech companies. We tend to provide real-life examples from guests and experts uh, across the board. Now, we've taken a bit of a summer break during July, which we well, well deserved a summer break uh, in the Nordic tradition, which usually takes about a month. But we're back now. And to celebrate this momentous occasion and, of course, uh, a successful summer, uh, we decided to draw a bit of a line in the sand uh, and start a new season of this show. That means, dear listeners, that this is episode one of season two of Fintech Daydreaming. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the show. I'm Ville Sointu, and I will be your host for t- uh, today for this episode. I am joined, as always, by my close friend and co-host, Paul Grugdahl. Paul, tell us about your summer. Summer was fantastic. It was too short. It was um, for typical for Finland, right? The minute I actually went on vacation, it got cold. And then it was a week of cold and, and wind. And as soon as, as the sort of vacation period ended, it got hot again. Mm. Right? Typical. But, yeah, typical. But apart from that, it was really, really good. Um, yeah. Fantastic time. Yeah, I think most of us uh, had to stay in, in domestic circumstances due to the, to the situation with the virus and everything. Uh, but I think it, it kind of turned out well. Uh, I got a chance to go to the Finnish archipelago a little bit, uh, explore maybe a little bit more Finland than I'm used to, uh, mm-hmm. when usually on summer breaks, uh, Finns tend to travel abroad, uh, but uh, not this summer. Uh, and I, I think it's been different kind of summer, but in a, in a good way. I think it's always good to uh, explore your home country a little bit more. But hey, let's get started. People want to hear about the fantastic world of fintech, so let's get started. Now, today's episode is going to be a bit of a treat for all you fintech nerds out there, uh, because we're going to straight off the deep end uh, of one of the hot topics uh, in the financial services today. And that is financial market infrastructure and central bank digital currencies. I told you it was going to be nerdy, right? Uh, So this is going to be a a deeper dive into those topics. Now, while this topic has been widely covered in many outlets already, uh, it always kind of bothered me that no one really explained in plain English what does it actually take to make this shift uh, uh, to fully digital and interoperable central bank money happen? And more importantly, why does it matter? At least I haven't been able to find a good explanation to either of these questions. uh, And it's always uh, interesting to understand how do we actually make these things uh, a reality. Now, when we chose this topic for today's episode, we wanted to have someone on as a guest who actually has walked the talk uh, in terms of trying to make this complex infrastructure level opportunity a reality. And that being said, our guest today is Olaf Ransom, uh, and he has made an incredible career out of being uh, in the trenches of financial services transformation. Olaf has decades of experience in systemic level work and and lately has been involved uh, in some of the most ambitious projects in this space, like the utility settlement coin, uh, which was later uh, named uh, Finality as it stands today. So, hi Olaf, how are things with you today? And uh, could you tell us a little bit more about your background at the same time? Good morning to both of you and thanks for having me on the show. I'm sitting down here in the very warm and sunny climes of Zurich, uh, which has been, uh, which has been 
the place I've been holed up on since uh, holed up in since the the middle of March. And uh, as you said, even with summer holidays, you don't get to go far. The furthest I've been in months is uh, to the wonderful principality of Liechtenstein, which counts as going abroad if you're Swiss, mm. and that's as far as it is. Um, no plane, no planes in my life in the last uh, five months. So my background is really on the operational side of investment or wholesale banking, uh, building stuff and fixing complicated problems for banks and ensuring that those things don't spring up again. Uh, that's a career that's taken me from London to New York, to Zurich, to Joburg, Moscow, Stockholm as well, mm -hmm. and the Middle East, and then back to Zurich. Um, in the last couple of years, uh, I was working closely uh, it, with the folks at the USC project, uh, which, as you said, has been renamed uh, Finality. That's one of the key efforts underway to have cash on Ledger so that we can deal with the tokenized economy. Uh, and that's currently uh, the main focus of, uh, of things I'm working on. Yeah, nice. And I think the last time we met Olaf in person was in uh, in Paris. Uh, we're both in the OECD uh, Blockchain Advisory Board. Uh, that was a fun fun meeting to to be in with you. Uh, I think it was, it was literally the last uh, trip abroad uh, that I made before everything kind of closed down. Yeah, that's that's a great forum. One of the the things about DLT and tokenization that goes with it is that it's all about collaboration. Uh, you can't get too many benefits out of this promising new technology without doing things together. And that collaboration uh, requires opportunity. Uh, it requires expertise and it requires people to share uh, that expertise and, and, and give their knowledge to others. And so uh, great forum. Yeah, uh, I agree. That was there. And I seem to remember talking about lawnmowers and the Internet of Things in the cab on the way to the app. <laughs> we did. We did. We're going to do an episode on that, by the way, uh, later on about the IoT and payments in IoT. So that's going to be a fun episode to uh, uh, to record as well in the future. And uh, it's, I agree. It's one that... of your, uh, it's, it's one of your uh, pet hobbies at the moment, oh, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Villa? Oh uh, yeah, yeah. you mowing lawn, yeah, of course. Uh, no, no uh, IoT, of course. Yes. Now uh, the uh, yeah. So just on OECD briefly, the uh, the I think it was a really interesting uh, venue. There's a lot of people there, a lot of expertise around the table. Uh, one of some of the well most well known names in in the crypto and blockchain space, uh, and most importantly, people disagreeing on a lot of things. Uh, so I think uh, that was a good thing to kind of have many kinds of opinions and, and OECD trying to kind of come down the middle uh, to have something uh, sensible. Uh, so collaboration, cooperation, just like you said, Olaf. So that was an interesting example of how, how to work uh, in this space going forward. But hey, uh, let's get to the uh, to the meat of the episode, which is to talk about the uh, financial market infrastructure and all things tokenization and cash on ledger. So just a bit of a kind of an introduction to the uh, to the topic today. So First of all, financial market infrastructure, which is actually the, the plumbing uh, that makes bank, banks run uh, in the background. Now, this infrastructure has been built over decades and decades of complex legal and regulatory requirements, as we know. And uh, but at the same time, as technology progresses, uh, so we started somewhere from paper checks, telegrams and fax machines. And today we have uh, real time connectivity. The question, of course, always is, especially uh, if you're working in the tech sector, is that why does it take for banks so long uh, to actually uh, adopt these new technologies? Uh, it, why is it so easy to send email? Why is it so easy to communicate with anybody in the world? But why is it so complicated to send money uh, between institutions and people? And uh, uh, this brings us to uh, the usual things that you always hear in this space, and this is the the, the way to innovate uh, this new infrastructure. And in my mind, there's uh, there's two high level ways, uh, really high level ways uh, of trying to move things forward in this space. And the first one is uh, is basically trying to build something completely uh, different from scratch uh, and force a radical change. I think uh, the permissionless blockchain companies are trying to uh, do exactly this. Uh, or uh, you work from within. Uh, 
uh, you create evolutionary change uh, that is typically both uh, a bit boring uh, and at the same time uh, also at the very least very slow. So it's basically all of us uh, poor souls working in banks trying to uh, move things forward uh, from within uh, and uh, of course uh, und uh, understanding and moving things from an evolutionary standpoint always takes a lot of patience and time uh, to do uh, as well. Now balancing between these two approaches is not easy. I mean, of course, people like me coming from a tech background and being trying to kind of innovate in this space for a long time, we're always attracted by the uh, quote unquote sex and violence of, of disruptive innovation. But you also need to be mindful that when you are tempted by this disruptive in innovation, like uh, blockchain based uh, cash on ledger, for example, uh, in in the way for example bitcoin is doing it you also need to be mindful that uh when you do that try to disrupt this current infrastructure place uh they, this infrastructure has been built there and everything or most of the things you see in there are there for a reason and these are related typically to legal requirements and risk management uh and these are things you just cannot ignore especially when you're dealing with people's money uh and trust uh in the banking space now, moving into the kind of the topic uh, of today, which is the central bank aspect to this. Now, central banks are literally in the middle of financial market infrastructure. Now, they are managing perhaps the world's most commonly known legacy technology, which is physical cash, uh, which has been an incredible technical success uh, with its limitations. Uh, it is always magical when you think about it. Uh, you give a paper note to someone else and then that other person thinks that they are richer and you are poorer. Uh, all you did was you handed over a paper note. I think that's a, as a technology is quite uh, quite unique uh, if you look at it from that perspective. But uh, its limitations in the digital domain, of course, are obvious. Uh, and uh, more importantly, copying the actual benefits of physical cash in the digital world uh, is not easy. The replicating this trust uh, that you have for handing over a dollar bill uh, is uh, is not easy in the digital world. And. The other side of this, of course, is that digital payments is already there. Uh, you can already pay with your uh, cards uh, and uh, people are tend to understand this uh, as, as a thing that already works. Uh, and I think uh, even institutions might not ultimately care if money is issued by a central bank, like in the case of physical cash, or if it's just uh, money on their bank accounts. Money, after all, uh, is just money uh, for most people and companies. So with that long introduction, let's get actually started and, uh, and let the experts talk uh, instead of me rambling around here. So, Olaf, uh, I'm going to set you up with a bit of a challenging question in the beginning. I hope you don't mind, uh, but I, I, I have no doubt that you're one of the best persons to, to make sense of this uh, to our listeners as well. People talk about, and even I mentioned uh, just now, cash on ledger, central bank digital currency, tokenized money. Uh, there's a lot of terms out there, uh, but what are we actually talking about here? And what are the differences between different types of what, what we call uh, digital cash? Nice, nice softball to start with. <laughs> so, um, so cash on ledger and tokenized money. Let's start at one end of the spectrum, which is Bitcoin. Bitcoin is just a representation of something that says, hey, I'm a unit of account, I am a means of exchange, and I'm a store of value, or I want to be, which are the three functions of money. Uh, now, the problem with Bitcoin is it's not backed by anything. There's nothing behind it. A comment that I made early on when I discovered Bitcoin was it's rather like a Warhol. It's worth whatever anybody's willing to pay you for it. Uh, and that's Bitcoin. Nothing's going to change about that. Of course, if you're a Bitcoin maximalist, you might say, yeah, but what's the difference between that and the five pound note from Her Majesty's government in the UK that just says, I promise to pay the bearer on demand? The difference is that that's backed by uh, the British government. And there is a general acceptance that five pounds today will be worth five pounds tomorrow and you can you can spend it. So that's the subtle difference between Bitcoin and fiat currency. As you move across the spectrum, then along came Tether and said, tell you what, since lots of people want to do transactions on DLT, we need some form of tokenized money. So you, dear customers, give us your money and we'll give you some tokens. Um, the challenge with that particular part of the thing is that Tether is just a commercial organization. It doesn't even hold its dollars directly in the US. 
So what you end up with is what I call the layer cake of risk. You've got Tether as a commercial organization. And if you've been paying attention over the last two years, you've noticed that Tether has been almost as reluctant as Wirecard to let people look at their books and mm. fully understand that if it says they've taken in $100 million, that they have $100 million in cash. And in any case, even if they had $100 million in cash, it's a commercial organization and they may have some other debts. You've then got the risk with Tether of the bank they use. And historically, I understand they've used a bank in the Middle East that's in the way. And then ultimately, you've got a bank in the US and that bank actually holds the dollars, but you have no deposit uh, protection uh, mm -hmm. as you would if you're a retail client. So I call that a layer cake of risk. Yeah. So it, that's what you get if you hold your money uh, with a commercial organization um, like a tether or, or, or even a circle. So that might be okay for small amounts of money, uh, it's certainly not good for big institutional amounts of money. If you keep moving across the spectrum, the next thing you get is a bank issued stable coin. The most notable of these is JPM coin. There is no difference whatsoever between a balance of a million dollars of JPM coin and a balance of a million dollars at JP. In both cases, whoever's holding that token is taking JP Morgan risk or as the expression goes, in Jamie, we trust. Hmm. It makes no difference um, because if if JP Morgan went bust, uh, God forbid that would happen, but if it did, your claim is no different from anybody else's claim who had dollars, who had other commercial claims on, on JP Morgan. So stable coins issued by banks may be useful inside of the four walls of the particular institution, but they're of no great use outside the walls of that institution. So you move across and now you get into the, the what started as CBDC territory, central bank, central bank digital coins or digital currency, different flavors of that that you can do. Fundamentally, on the institutional side, at least, what people want is commercial is central bank risk. So now comes the question of, how do you organize for this cash-like instrument uh, in a way that it can be widely used? Technologically, it's pretty straightforward for central banks to come up with a coin and issue it. Then comes the whole question of supporting its distribution and all the KYC that goes with it. So if you would imagine that the Bank of England said, hey, we're gonna be great, we're gonna issue CBDC, they then have to deal with everybody who wants to hold it, which is a big challenge. They'd also have to deal with all the technology platforms that want to interface with it, which is another big challenge. So what's emerged is a mixed term. The IMF have called it synthetic central bank digital currency, as in created by commercial banks, but the instrument is then backed by reserves held at a central bank. More recently, the Bank of England coined the term reserve-backed digital currency. And here the idea is, how do you manage risk so that where we talked about holding a JP coin and having the risk of JP, if there's an issuer of this SCBDC or RBDC, as the Brits have called it, how do you make sure that if Villa and Pal have got a hundred million dollars between them and one's got 60 million and the other's got 40 million, that if there's an issue, you can get to your money, uh, whether it's dollars, euros, pounds, or whatever. Uh, and, and that's solved by having uh, accounts with central banks so that you can be sure that the amount of coin or token in issuance is fully backed by collateral and that that collateral is available in the sad event of, uh, of a bankruptcy. So I guess, I mean, when you're listening to this kind of spectrum of different kinds of coins and different kinds of money, what brings, what, what kind of comes to my mind is that the, this, the big question of acceptance and distribution uh, is the differentiating factor here. Because 
when you when you move to the towards the uh, towards the kind of more central bank like uh, cash, you do end up with the KYC questions. You do need to know who is on the network, uh, who is receiving, and who is sending that uh, that cash. Whereas with the other side of this, the, the bitcoins and even tethers, uh, mostly working on these permissionless uh, networks. Uh, you, there's no requirement to, to know who's on the other side of any transaction because anybody can be a part of those networks by definition permission, permissionless networks. And I guess this dilemma of uh, knowing the identities in these networks and how do you build a network where KYC requirements uh, or know your customer requirements are met uh, is, is the, the key differentiator uh, between the permissionless and the permissioned world. Uh, That's definitely the case, uh, I think you will see tolerance from uh, central banks and from uh, the, the the multinational organizations such as the FSB and the BIS for permissioned networks, uh, but you won't see tolerance for permissionless networks. Uh, the Particularly the FSB, the Financial Stability Board, which is probably the the highest level of cooperation between the central banks is very focused on these new means of payment and have been at pains recently to point out to say, look, you can call it anything you want, but if it's a payments network, that's the same business as the payments we have. And we expect you to follow the rules that we have. Uh, just because you use DLT does not entitle you to uh, roll back the set of controls that uh, we've put in place and the and the consumer protections that go with it. Yeah, I uh, I couldn't agree more. Uh, I think this is uh, interesting that we we find the same themes in in a lot of uh, the conversations we're having on this podcast. And I uh, that kind of brings me to to our next kind of topic and, and question, which is uh, um, we already talked about this. Uh, uh, we touched this already, which is effectively we we need to mention uh, the B word, of course, the blockchain. Now, we've, we've already talked about these uh, challenges and opportunities that blockchain in general uh, brings uh, in our past episodes. Uh, but I think it might be kind of use, useful to bring this kind of kind of blockchain conversation uh, into, into this discussion as well. Now, I mean, I started in the blockchain world uh, around 2000, 2013 uh, when I first ran into Bitcoin, but in two, especially in 2015, it really looked like the, the entire financial market infrastructure, which is effectively what we're talking about here, would be running on a blockchain-based architecture in no time at all. Uh, I think I remember the Forbes magazine, magazine uh, cover with the, with the trust machine uh, logo in, in, the, in the front page, and that was definitely used by many consultants in many presentations, including me uh, back in the day. But uh, on top of that, I think one of the promises of, of, uh, of this uh, quote unquote blockchainification of the financial market infrastructure is that uh, we would definitely have a cash on ledger uh, that we just talked about. So we would definitely be able to transact in these networks in a, in a fairly free and transparent way uh, without the obstacles of, of legacy infrastructure. Now, well, what's your view into this? I mean, what are the biggest challenges that we haven't yet uh, overcome uh, to, to move into this new kind of uh, distributed architecture? And what have we learned uh, in these five years, uh, if anything? Well, ch change takes time, and we knew about that before we started. As far as the payment side and cash on ledger goes, I think the key lesson of the last couple of years has been that you have to ask for permission. So when we were kids and we were wondering whether we should go out on a Friday night, we were taught that we could either ask for permission or beg for forgiveness if we just ducked out the door and, and went anyway. Um, when I look at the work that what is now Finality has done and particularly the banks behind it, I think they took a very wise route, which is to ask for permission. And a lot of patient work has been done with the central banks building up over time to say, here's what's going to happen with DLT. We, the banks, believe in tokenization. We think this is going to happen. But in order to make the most of this, we need this cash on ledger. We need this payments capability. And that patient work has helped all of the parties understand what's tolerable and plausible. So in fact, once you've done all this work, what you discover is what you really need is a payment system. And you choose with that payment system 
to use DLT as the underlying technology because of uh, some general beliefs in the power of decentralization there and that that uh, is a better alternative to today's uh, financial market infrastructures, which are huge database constructions, uh, which have very vulnerable single points of failure. Um, we need only think of even just uh, cash ATM networks in the UK, which have had a habit of going down uh, in the past and the disruption that that causes uh, or uh, online platforms not being available. So there is a technical belief that DLT, if you're going to make a choice about future technology, um, offers you some superior choices. Uh, and now you've got uh, all those central banks and regulators on side understanding that we need this means of payment. It's just a payment system that we need and therefore this all feels a bit more tolerable and doesn't feel like oh risky risky new technology you're right i think the, the key thing there is that the change takes time i think five years is uh, especially in context of financial market infrastructure uh is definitely like a heartbeat <laughs> almost yes uh, all thing all things considered and i think we started the conversation today and talking about uh, all the people around the table at the OECD uh, blockchain advisory board and the amount of people there uh, and the different views and opinions uh, in that uh, room alone uh, is a good mirror of, of how difficult it is to come to a consensus and come to an agreement on, on what you actually want to do uh, especially yeah. because uh, Around that table, all of us agreed that distributed architecture is the way way to go. We we mainly argued about the uh, uh, what should what should the access model look like, uh, what should this trust model uh, look like uh, in this uh, general uh, blockchain uh, networks uh, going forward. Now now bring to the table uh, the uh, the the other side of this conversation, which is that uh, the the banks and the uh, market players that still want to stay with the uh, with the database models uh, of the past because hey they are tried and tested and they work so why should we change uh, we don't really want to change anything but yeah I think it's about uh, it really is about uh, articulating the uh, the benefits of this uh, <clears throat> benefits of this new modernization uh, to all parties uh, understanding that if if modernization happens in the correct way then you are able to uh, come with benefits for all uh, even with less risk uh, hopefully yeah. this is a really tough area because i think at the start of the adventure you can persuade the investment arms of banks to back the r d work and the build-up work to build some new infrastructure that can be done and it's generally the investment arms who have a a longer term horizon and then you get to the point that you're like, right, we've built this thing. Now we want to roll it out. And here comes the challenge. Banks are notorious for having analysts who look at public companies and do lots of analytical work and get very critical about results. Um, they too, though, suffer a very short term outlook. So once you've built some base infrastructure what you find if you're in the fmi space or the utility space you're sitting there going great in order for this network to be useful we need metcalf's law to apply we need lots of people to use it so banks get ready to use it what you then find is that the banks all turn around and go ah oh, we need a business case for each little thing that we do even though the first few steps do not on their own make a great business case. And there you just see the short term side of the banks. The reason for that is that those decisions are at a business unit level. And if you go to someone at a business unit level and say, look, I could do something for you and get you a little dollop of jam tomorrow. But if you're patient in two years, I'll give you a big pot of honey. 99 times out of 100, they'll vote for jam tomorrow. <laughs> they have got no patience for the big pot of honey in two years uh, for a couple of reasons. One is this year's bonus depends on this year's results. Uh, the other is that uh, in part, many of those people won't be in the seat in two years time. So who the hell cares? Um, and infrastructure, you know, infrastructure is something that lasts. We're talking here about what are we going to build 
that's going to be used for the next 50 years. Mm-hmm. This this whole thing, it's, it's like a moment of having SWIFT or a CLS, uh, which we've used for foreign exchange settlement. This is a fundamental change. And the only place where in a bank, any sort of strategic view really comes together is the CEO, the CFO, maybe the treasurer who's looking at how he's set up. Uh, and you've got that that fight on your hands of, of long-term need on infrastructure versus short-term optic of particular businesses. And I have to give a, I suppose, a wooden spoon award to a very large bank who I had the following discussion with and told me about finality and mm-hmm. getting started with using uh, the facilities. And they said, it was a large, a large clearer in one of the, one of the currencies said, we really want to just uh, wait and be a fast follower. And I'm looking at them as a major clearer. I'm going, oh, for heaven's sake, if you <laughs> all want to sit on the fence on your comfy sofa, nobody will get to be a fast follower. So sorry, folks, you're going to have to disabuse yourself of that notion that you can sit in comfort on the fence and, and get stuck in. Otherwise, there's nothing to talk about here. But all of that's a true story. Yeah, and uh, it's a little bit too close for comfort uh, in my mind as well. But OK, uh, let's move on. <laughs> so the, uh, I guess the what we also need to define a little bit how do we actually get this done? What should, where should we start? So, well, I mean, based on your opinions, we already heard a lot of, a lot of good comments uh, uh, towards this. But what do you think is the first problem that we should solve uh, when talking about the FMI modernization? The, definitely cash. Uh, we do need to solve for cash on ledger, which I think the folks at Finality will do. I think you'll also see some central banks uh, opening up to that. I think the, the Swiss are one of those possibilities. Uh, and quite likely you can make those two things coexist. Um, the second thing that we need to do is to then put some use cases onto a tokenized infrastructure. I think from my observation of the industry as it stands now, that those first use cases will be asset classes that haven't been securitized until now. Um, with, with the goal of making those assets more um, available than they were before. The two favorite ones in that area are real estate uh, and loans, uh, the, the loan business. In both cases, these are assets that banks have on their balance sheet where the primary issuance, the first step is is a complex process. So DLT offers you the prospect that the primary issuance piece could be much quicker. Uh, I was talking with some very clever folks at Symbiont in the US a couple of weeks back who'd just done a, a proof of concept in asset-backed securities uh, with uh, Vanguard uh, and an uh, asset-backed issuer. And they were telling me that using DLT, they can improve the settlement cycle from five days to same day. So that's worth having a better primary process then if you've got that and you've done primary, you can do secondary trading, um, which is useful because if you think about real estate assets and loan assets, largely the banks keep these things in their books and kind of hold them to maturity, if you like, because it's too complicated to move them on. So if they've been tokenized, we might have a secondary market or at the very least, you could use them as collateral. So imagine if, uh, let's pick a bank, um, imagine if UBS could securitize all of these uh, loans to small and medium-sized businesses that, that have just been made as part of the COVID-19 rescue effort, they could turn that into collateral. Today, they can't use it as collateral. So mm-hmm. that's a sort of second order benefit. And if you keep going, you know, eventually your your level three assets, these hard to price things that require a lot of capital, move up the food chain to to level two assets. So I think cash on ledger number one, uh, na- native to blockchain, so assets num- number two uh, mm. that's in there. And after that, you then have to start to say, well, how do we how do we rethink the current processes in FMIs? Uh, Great example of that would be our friends over in the States at the DTCC with their project ION, trying to think about 
what do they do next? How do they grasp all of the potential that DLT has to offer with existing securities and existing processes and, and reimagine them? Okay, so cash on ledger number one. Uh, I think that makes a lot of sense uh, and uh, definitely a hard problem to solve as well. But we, we're, what we're talking about here with, with FMI, of course, uh, is institutional uh, cash, uh, I, would, I would say. But uh, just for our listeners to kind of get a bit of context to this, uh, Paul, uh, I, I remember we had a bit of a back and forth on, on what could uh, and should this uh, digital cash look like from a regular consumer perspective. I'm not sure if we actually ever get to, got to an agreement on anything in, in that discussion, but could you remind us and, uh, and our listeners a bit, uh, does this digital cash or cash on ledger uh, really change anything in the eyes of the consumer? And what would be the potential benefits for, for the usual people on the street uh, if they would have uh, digital cash in their hands? Yeah, I, th I think we, uh, we've had this as a ongoing discussion, Villa, and I think the discussion hasn't ended because this is still early days. I think if we look at, at uh, more sort of modern forward-looking uh, nations or countries, Sweden is a good example, right? They, they are getting quite far in the, the journey with the e-corner. But I think digital cash uh, or the, the representation of cash in a digital way is for the time being, as, as Olaf has already said, I mean, it's, it's predominantly aimed at, at corporate banking more than retail banking for the unforeseeable future, I think. But Olaf, you might have a, a slightly different perspective on that. But I also think there is, there is uh, still a large portion of unbanked people in the world where, where cash is very important. So I think if we remove that from underneath, you know, homeless people, low income people, etc., we end up in a new dilemma and a new problem that that needs to be solved. So I think there is a a slow journey that has to be gone on here when it comes to um, individuals and, and regular consumers from a, a digital currency perspective. But I think most people have got used to um, you know, digital payments, uh, paying with Apple Pay or, or Google Pay, etc. Um, so, so that journey towards um, a more adoption of digital currencies is is going to be. I don't think it's going to be a a large shock wave that will ripple, right? But it, we can see we can see some other benefits when we start talking about programmable money, smart money, uh, and digital currencies. If you could imagine. You know, for instance, rather than having to do your tax returns uh, once a year, it could actually be done on a, a, a running band, right? As, as everything is being managed through, through a digital uh, ledger, then, then why couldn't you manage your taxes and pay your taxes um, on an ongoing basis as well? Mm -hmm. uh, we also will see, obviously, if, if cash stops being physical and becomes on a, a permissioned ledger, it's going to be a lot more difficult to fund terrorism and, and other uh, unsavory activities. So I think that's going to be, be a benefit as well. But um, I think this is, this is still in, in early discussions, and I think it's going to have both positive and, and negative impacts. Um, and, and obviously, we can understand why the banking community and the government, uh, et cetera, want to go in this direction. Yeah, I think the... Uh... I think what we do agree on this, of course, is that uh, once everything is done, uh, the technology doesn't matter. It's the benefits of this new architecture yes. that should be visible for uh, for consumers. And uh, ultimately, I think we I started at the beginning saying that uh, for most people, money is just money. As long as you trust the institution that is providing it to you, then uh, it, you you should see the benefits. And I think that is. Uh, Definitely a good baseline uh, to to end this uh, conversation today uh, on uh, on digital cash. But before we close the episode today, there's a, our usual segment in the end where we 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 look at uh, some of the news stories or one news story uh, in particular, uh, and we try to kind of uh, bring a bit of a palate cleanser in the end uh, for this conversation. Now, usually these topics are quite uh, far away from what, what we discussed, but today I, I found something interesting, uh, which is actually quite close to the things that we discussed. And this is Goldman Sachs uh, hiring a, uh, a new head uh, of digital assets. Uh, and I think, I'm not sure if it's a new unit in Goldman Sachs, but it's, uh, it's definitely a, a high profile hire. Uh, they hired uh, 
uh, Matthew McDermott as the global head uh, of digital assets. Uh, furthermore, uh, they recruited uh, a, for, a former JP Morgan uh, person who would be responsible for uh, parts of the JPM coin that we discussed earlier, also working with the Quorum, uh, Quorum uh, blockchain uh, platform, uh, a, a, a person named Oli Harris, uh, as I think, as the head of uh, strategy. Now, clearly, Goldman is now moving into doing something in this space. And I guess everybody, whoever has hold any, held any cryptocurrencies uh, is asking now, are the incumbents coming? Are they finally coming? Will my, will my investments now move? Uh, so are the incumbents coming? What do you think? Huh. If I'll offer a, a view on that. So, so Goldman have really stepped up by putting Matt McDermott in charge. He was already at the bank. Yeah, he's an MD in uh, collateral management. And he succeeds a guy called Justin Schmidt, uh, who was there before him. So I think the first word you'd use is, is upgrade, which equals commitment. Hiring in uh, the gentleman from JP uh, is another sign of is another sign of commitment. So, yep, that looks like the incumbents are coming. What was also interesting was to read Matt's comment that he thinks banking infrastructure can all get onto DLT. Uh, I think mm -hmm. his time frames at like the next five years were perhaps a bit optimistic, but hey, uh, you got to make a speech when you come into the new job. It's always but, five years now, is it? Yeah, right. Um, but that that's really useful when a Goldman uh, sh uh, throws their weight behind these things. Uh, my experience, certainly on the financial market infrastructure side in the past, has that Goldman have been the um, best in class at sitting on the fence and assuming that they can be a fast follower. Um, so it's great here to see them taking steps to be a driver uh, rather than a follower. Mm. Paul, any thoughts? I, I, no, I think I'll agree. I, I think that's uh, that's spot on. And, and we're, see, we're seeing most banks moving in this direction, right? There is there is no doubt that there is change afoot. Digitization is, is becoming uh, more relevant. COVID has helped to push us in that direction. So, so to a certain degree, it's not a surprising announcement. Yeah, yeah. I think we'll see some interesting announcements here from, from other institutions as well. Uh, I think Goldman is uh, showing the way uh, here. Absolutely, yes. Perfect. But good. Hey, unfortunately, my friends, uh, as always, time flies when you're having fun. So we need to close this uh, fantastic episode of Fintech Daydream. So thank you for a great conversation, gentlemen. But before we finally close the episode, uh, Olaf, uh, Paul and I would like to give you a chance to let the listeners know uh, how can they find you? How can they get in touch? And uh, what else is going on uh, in your life right now? Right. Well, I'm an easy guy to find. Uh, LinkedIn is probably the best place. And if you put in the banker's plumber, you'll find me. <laughs> um, that's the, the easiest way uh, to look me up. Uh, make a connection on LinkedIn uh, and uh, and you'll get to me pretty quick or otherwise uh, via my uh, website, which is 3 C advisory.com. Uh, you can you can find me there. Uh, Right now, uh, funnily enough, what's going on in my life? I I took I'm telling Paul this just before we started. Uh, I took a podcasting course uh, oh. over over the last six or seven weeks, uh, and I'm going to try and launch something uh, which is going to be called the Banker's Plumber Lessons Learned. Nice. Trying to look at uh, where does stuff go wrong in banking? Why does it go right? Uh, what's coming next? Uh, so uh, I was also getting some insights on that on the platform you guys use so a little, little, little bit of practice um during the off season as i look for the uh, for the next mandate in and around the digital world thanks well, let, for let having us, me let us know when it's uh, when it's up and running and we'll uh, happily promote it for you thank you very much to both. shameless plug but we enjoy absolutely it. <laughs> yes Fantastic. And thank you again, Olaf, for coming on to the show. Uh, and thank you for all the great insights you shared us with here uh, today. And of course, most of all, thank you all, uh, all to all our great listeners uh, out there. Now, finally, do you have a fintech subject you would like Paul and I to cover in future episodes? Uh, or maybe you just have a great story to share or would like to join us as a guest? In any case, ping us on LinkedIn or on our anchor.fm page and let us know. Get in touch. 
see you uh, now see you all again in two weeks time and and we will have another great guest uh, with us this has been fintech daydreaming